America's fascination with sex in the 1980s is matched only by its massive confusion of attitudes towards it. We need the pleasure of sex, but can't decide how to deal with the emotional pain and complexity that often accompanies it. We have all felt guilty, conflicted, or alienated by our sexual involvements and commitments at one time or another. From where does sex draw such enormous power to influence our lives? No doubt there is a biological imperative at work. The species need to reproduce and continue itself. Less clear but equally powerful is the way sexual feelings become ensnared in the complex web of our culture. Eventually the culture-wide sex habits become a powerful set of unconscious influences. Most of us have been carrying the excess baggage of the sexual mores of our age for so long that we've forgotten how heavy the load is. The cultural legacies of the Judeo-Christian ethic were the axis around which the sexual experiments of the 1960s revolved. The neurotic and barren lifestyles of this ethic in previous generations were among the major causes of the sexual revolution of the 1960s. Alienated by sexual hypocrisy and the obvious destructive effects of sexual repression, people began searching for new and more honest ways of expressing their desires. Over the last 20 years, we have seen the sexual revolution come full circle. What was previously illicit and forbidden became commonplace and banal. Some seek a solution to this current dilemma by returning to the old morality. Some seek refuge in celibacy. And some of us are still searching. The far-reaching implications of the sexual revolution of the 1960s, including the various liberation movements that have accompanied it, are now being re-examined in the wake of widespread conflict and unhappiness between men and women. The recent quest for a new frontier for the sexuality of the 1980s, a trend that is beginning to appear in the popular media, is essentially a reaction to the unhappy results of the new morality experiments of the last two decades. We thought we knew what we wanted but when we got it, we realized something else was missing. Individually and culturally, we are again examining the meaning of our sexuality and the deeper purposes served by our loving relationships. Many new ideas are now emerging from the New Age Consciousness Movement, which address this need. Witness, for example, the concept of high monogamy, which emphasizes the challenge and excitement of conscious, through time, relationships that transcend romantic egotism. The much publicized revival of popular interest in Indian and Tibetan sexual tantra is another example. Others are re-examining the merits of celibacy. The sexual paradigm is shifting again, part of the polar shift of the American morality play. As this play continues, we are further mystified by the moral majority seeking to revive the old repressions and neurotic patterns which drove us to seek relief in Many of us are struggling to understand the meaning of the conflict between the old and new sexual morality. Can we avoid the pitfalls of both repressive and liberated sexual morality 
which are by now all too familiar. Where do we turn for guidance in seeking our own truly individual answers? Unfortunately, our views about human sexuality are constantly shaped by the fads and fashions of science and popular culture. We are influenced as much as by these trends from Dr. Spock to the herpes scare as we are by the actual biochemical processes of our bodies and minds. We often know more about who and what we are from what we read or see on television than from a deeply lived experience of ourselves. It is obvious that we lack a clear and impartial vision of our own sexual social conditioning. Our self-knowledge is usually derived from the world of well-known experts, books, films, TV, magazines, rather than from a patient understanding of our deepest gut feelings or intuitions. The power of these cultural influences can be understood by carefully noting the cyclical and often contradictory scientific and psychological theories about sexuality found in the popular media. We can easily conclude that consistent, valid and practical guidelines for the physical, physiological and spiritual health of men and women are few and far between. This conclusion applies to most of our diff difficult social and interpersonal problems but is especially true in the sexual arena. The fact is that we really don't know much from our scientific or popular media sources about the function of sex beyond the obvious reproductive and pleasure principle arguments that have influenced all of our thinkers from Freud up to the more recent sociobiologists. Unfortunately, our lives are powerfully affected by this loss of personal sexual self-knowledge. As a society, we have chosen to ignore what the great spiritual traditions once understood about sexual energy and its role in personal transformation and spiritual evolution. What knowledge we once had has been fragmented or distorted by the institutionalized Judeo-Christian religions and remade to serve the lesser gods of social, political and personal control. Our Western institutional religious tradition has essentially repressed and distorted the sexual instinct and thereby created a variety of personal and social pathologies. In so doing, it has also effectively removed sexuality from its spiritual foundations. In this respect, Western psychoanalysis correctly perceived the role of repressed sexuality in individual neurosis. Whatever limitations the psychoanalytic view may have as a full representation of human potential, this much can be granted to Freud's insights. Wilhelm Reich and Carl Jung understood quite well the enormous power of liberated sex energy and its connection to a larger universe of spiritual meaning. Jung rightly protested Freud's emphasis on disease as a model for health, as well as the narrowness of his understanding of the range and purpose of the unconscious. He correctly emphasized instead the creative and transcendental function of sexual energy within the spiritually attuned and evolving individual. But all of these psychologists and their legacies have missed the point in one way or another. It is true that the sexual instinct can both liberate and enslave, but in order to be truly liberating, the sexual instinct must be channeled in the direction of another purpose. 
only in conjunction with the drive for spiritual transformation can sex become truly liberating. Because of his lack of knowledge of the great spiritual traditions, Freud was completely unable to see this point. Wilhelm Reich, whose work has influenced so much of the human potential movement's body-centered therapies, was bold enough to bring Freud's insights to their logical conclusion. But in his zeal to emphasize the destructive effects of sexual repression, he also ignored the spiritually transforming functions of sex energy. Carl Jung had just the opposite problem. He clearly emphasized the spiritual and transcendental perspective on the sexual instinct, but he left out the central role of the physical body in this development. This omission made it next to impossible to apply Jung's elaborate intellectual models to daily problems of sexuality. So we search in vain within Western psychology to find the practical disciplines and principles we need in order to reconcile the conflicts which face us in the sexual realm. This is a simple and ordinary dilemma. But when we want to harmonize our sexual and love relationships with our spiritual goals, our situation seems especially poignant. Time and time again, the sexual function proves to be a disruptive influence, generating conflict and division in our lives. It should not be too surprising, therefore, that celibacy has become an appealing alternative to so many who wish to follow a spiritual path while remaining worldly men and women. These facts become even more obvious when we observe the behavior of the gurus, swamis, and other teachers in New Age spiritual circles. The numerous examples of apparently celibate spiritual teachers born and raised in the puritanical context of traditional oriental cultures and suddenly set loose in the American new morality is simultaneously sad and funny. We frequently hear of this guru or that master who has fallen into the temptation of sexual relations with, which, with their disciples. Scandals have now become almost commonplace in the ashram or dojo. One does not need to become cynical about this in order to recognize that the sexual instinct is bound to find its expression in rather prosaic and predictable ways, no matter what the official spiritual dogma may condone or prohibit. This has been true one way or another throughout the history of the institutionalized Judeo-Christian churches as well as in the New Age spiritual scene, embracing as it does so much of the Buddhist and Hindu lifestyles. In regard to sex, institutional religion, old or new, has little to offer us. Turning to examples of the teachers of sexual tantra, the gap between theory and practical knowledge becomes rather obvious. We hear of the marvelous and ecstatic rewards of tantric inspired relationships. Our New Age spiritual bookshops and periodicals lend themselves increasingly to the interest and fascination with esoteric sexual practices. But what is the real purpose of esoteric sexuality? And where can one find real knowledge and practical instruction in these publications. How is it possible for someone to actually apply these rituals in a form that is applicable to ordinary life and relationships? And how much do we really understand of the actual esoteric teachings when they are removed from the larger religious and ritualistic context of the Hindu and Buddhist traditions. In order to answer these questions, we need to accurately understand 
esoteric sexuality as the study and control of sex of sex energy within ourselves having little or no connection with outer rituals of culture beyond this we need practical methods that can be understood by the western mind and applied in contemporary life one way to discover these methods is to identify the essential life-affirming aspects of sexuality found in mankind's cultural and spiritual traditions and determine which work today. We must carefully separate what we need to guide ourselves in the sexual realm without getting bogged down <clears throat> in outmoded ways of thinking and living. The tradition of Taoism, the core of Chinese culture, represents an interesting and practical perspective on this question. The ancient Chinese masters observed that the sexual function is closely related to physical and mental health and is also the basis for cultivation of higher spiritual faculties. The position that effective conservation of life force energy and its gradual transformation into a kind of spiritual and material substance is both the birthright and responsibility of mankind. When practiced within the monastic tradition of religious Taoism, the conservation and cultivation of sex energy was largely a matter of celibacy. But in its wisdom, the Taoist tradition also provided another or practical way. The path of sexual Kung Fu, sometimes called seminal and ovarian Kung Fu. This practice indicated a way by which a married monk or ordinary man and women could cultivate the Tao, the way, while remaining in worldly life. Because of its eminently practical orientation in matters of health and living, the Taoist tradition addressed sexual relationships in a straightforward and realistic manner. The Taoist sexual Kung Fu was and is today a method of increasing longevity and health, harmonizing the relationship between the sexes and a means of spiritual transformation. Aside from some historical distortions in which the basic egalitarian nature of the practice were subverted by emperors and aristocrats in the direction of a kind of male exploitation of the female. The basic premise of the method of sexual Kung Fu is that of spiritual development and the harmony of the male and female energies. Accustomed as we are in our Western traditions to consider the field of sex sexology from within the limits of our religions and scientific and cultural conditioning, it is difficult for us to grasp the essential meaning of the metaphor of sexual Kung Fu. We have a vague understanding of some kind of relationship to the martial arts but beyond this, the concept of a sexual Kung Fu seems comical, if not downright ridiculous. In fact, the literal meaning of Kung Fu is method, practice, or discipline. The concept of sexual Kung Fu implies a specific method of practical discipline of having sex without ejaculation. At the same time, the Taoist tradition recognizes a certain form of conflict between the sexes, a form that is universally represented by the lawful opposition and dynamic interplay of the forces of yin and yang. This lawful opposition plays itself out on the battlefield of sexual relations and is expressed as the playful conflict between sexual adversaries. A conflict, by the way, 
in which man is weaker than his strong enemy, and where the kung fu of ejaculation control is developed as a way of remedying this imbalance of sexual force. In the Western world, we also have a related notion of a battle between the sexes, but we easily make a major error by assuming that this expression connotates the same meaning as the Taoist metaphor in anything other than the most superficial sense of conflict. Our Western concept of the battle between the sexes conveys the morbidity and frustration of the ponderously serious sexual dramas which dominate so much of our current thinking about relationships. It has little to do with the playful and transformative aspects of sex as they are understood in the Taoist tradition. Only when we move our thinking to the level of sexual energy is it possible for us to begin to see how the sexual function can be properly understood and correctly employed in the service of sexual harmony and health. According to the Taoist view, man is constitutionally inferior to woman with respect to his sexual capacities. His energies are easily spent and with the advancement of years his energetic capacity becomes severely diminished. It is this factor that is a major cause of conflict between men and women and it is this factor that is the basic underlying issue of so much of the current sexual counseling and sex therapy. From our contemporary perspective, the idea of a sexual kung fu seems odd and maybe even a little revolutionary. But with the growing interactions of Oriental and Western culture and medicine and the resultant impact on Western sexology, the principles and methods of seminal and ovarian kung fu could gradually become accepted. Considering the fact that Western sexological research is quite young, we might anticipate the kind of confusion that one finds in a teenager exploring his or her sexuality. By contrast, the Taoist tradition is over 8,000 years old and has reached a full maturity in both theory and method. In fact, both traditions are dealing with the control of the same powerful impulse. Whether or not the Taoist sexual kung fu can work in Western society will be determined in part by its translation of it into Western forms of scientific understanding and psychology. Its acceptance may hinge equally on the willingness of Westerners to adapt themselves to the wisdom of the Taoist masters. The ancient Taoist masters would enjoy this play of opposing forces as the inevitable working of the Tao. A young Taoist master has taken the bold step of revealing the secret methodology to the West. It is up to the reader to test the truth. Summary of the principles of Taoist cultivation of sexual energy. The universe is filled with different kinds of dynamic energy or qi. The Tao or the way for each man is to creatively transform his energy over a course of a lifetime back to its original state of harmonious balance. Sexual essence or Qing is a powerful vital energy that is generated continuously within the human body. Sexual drive propels the course of man's evolution biologically by transmitting the genetic lineage. Emotionally, it harmonizes the love between man and woman and spiritually provides a tangible link between the ordinary creative powers 
of man and the eternal creative process of the cosmos. Refining one's awareness of sexual energy, with or without a partner, is one of the simplest ways of humans to return to pure consciousness and experience the deepest rhythms of life. Sperm is the storehouse of male sexual energy. A single ejaculation has 200 to 500 million sperm cells, each a potential human being. There are enough spermatozoa lost in a single orgasm to populate the entire United States if each cell was to fertilize an egg. The manufacture of a sperm fluid capable of such psychic superpotency consumes, consumes up to a third of a man's daily energy output and is especially taxing on the male glandular immunological system. Conservation of sexual energy is the first principle of cultivation. Ejaculation of the male seed for purposes other than having children is a wasteful loss of an extremely precious treasure. The energy loss over long periods of time weakens the physical health of the male, can lead to unconscious emotional anger towards women, and gradually robs the male higher mind spirit of its power to rejuvenate itself. For this reason, many traditional spiritual orders in the world require male celibacy. Taoists accept se sexual love as natural and healthy, but know the momentary pleasure of genital orgasm with ejaculation is superficial compared to the profound ecstasy possible when love is enjoyed without the loss of the powerful male seed. It's every man's birthright to have full control over his bodily functions and prevent this loss. Transformation of sex energy is the second principle of cultivation. During sexual arousal, the Qing, or sexual essence stored in the testicles, expands rapidly and causes some energy to naturally rise to highest centers in the heart, brain, glands, and nervous system. This upward movement is cut short by ejaculation outward, so most men never become aware of the full power of their sexuality. The Taoist method perfects this upward transformation of sex energy by opening subtle channels from the genitals up the spine to the head and back down the spine to the navel. The expanding sexual energy is channeled into this microcosmic orbit, so it flows past all the major vital organs and harmonizes the etheric energy complexes in the body called Dantians by the Taoists, or chakras by the Hindus. Balancing the polarity of female-male or yin-yang forces is the third principle of Taoist cultivation. Once the sex energy has been conserved and transformed up, a single man can use meditation to balance the male and female poles which exist inside every male body. In the practice of dual cultivation, a couple balances this field of energy between them by sharing and circulating their subtle energies. The relationship becomes a springboard to transform the sexual attraction into personal love and then into spiritual awareness and service. The power struggle between the sexes gradually diminishes and balancing their differences over work, family, love, and the purpose of existence leads them into deeper harmony. Balancing this core sexual polarity in a couple is true depth psychology, as it nourishes man and woman at their innermost root. 
A higher level of this practice involves exchanging energy without sex or having orgasm within oneself and must be learned from a master. Don't overemphasize physical sex in your daily practice as it is easy to get stuck on pleasure without experiencing higher subtle energies. Proper sexual refinement is only one small part of the vast and all-encompassing Tao. If the mixture of your Qi, general vital energy, Qing, sex essence, and Xin, spirit, is imbalanced, it will be difficult to unite yourself and feel whole and peaceful. Cultivating sex energy is important in nourishing your spirit, but without proper diet, exercise, meditation, virtuous moral behavior and love, true cultivation is impossible. Likewise, don't ignore sex and focus excessively on the higher spiritual centers. The roof will easily fall without a strong foundation below. Tao is the wholeness of heaven and earth. True harmony for man is the middle way between them, found in the balanced integration of their subtle energies. Avoid sex without love. It creates imbalances in your physical, mental and spiritual bodies and will slow your real growth. The Taoist techniques are meant to be practical, not mechanical. A woman seeks tenderness of feeling in her lovers and will resent a man who is overly compulsive and preoccupied with his mechanical mastery of esoteric love methods. Dual cultivation is impossible without the full participation of the woman who must transform up her yin essence stored in her ovaries. Regard the woman you love as more than a powerful generator of yin energy. She is foremost a human being worthy of your full love and respect. You do not need a wife or girlfriend to cultivate your sexual energy. In the beginning, it is easier to practice controlling your ejaculation alone without the distracting excitement and heat of a woman. At any stage, it is essential to tell your lover exactly what you are doing and ask her co cooperation. The same principles of Taoist cultivation apply to women, with sexual essence drawn from the ovaries and this Qing transformed upward into higher mind and heart. Many women already have an intuitive feel for the process. The receptive nature of women allows them to quickly learn the Tao of love, especially if the man has mastered the process in his own body. Any male is in reasonably good health can master the Taoist methods of cultivating sexual energy. If you feel impotent or ejaculate prematurely, rejuvenation exercises should be studied the principles of cultivation are simple but require steady attention. It's like cultivating a garden. Hoe a little every day and nature will do the rest. One day you will have luscious blossoms and fruits. An impatient mind kills progress. Do not feel guilty or angry when you spill your seed. It may take years to fully master the Tao of love. The key is to relax, enjoy yourself, and keep practicing. There is no medicine or food and no spiritual salvation that can prolong a man's life if he fails to understand or practice the harmony of sexual energy. Peng Tzu, Physician to the Emperor For more than 8,000 years of Chinese history, the sexual kung fu method of retaining the seminal fluid during the act of love remained a deep secret. At first it was practiced exclusively by the emperor and his innermost circle, who learned it from the Taoist sages that advised the court. These wise men claimed 
in earlier times, it was a natural gift of all mankind. The emperor needed the method to prevent impotence and illness. Improperly educated monarchs were exhausted at an early age by the sexual demands of their wives and concubines. In aristocratic families, it passed from father to, to chosen son alone, excluding wives, daughters, and other family members. Sexual Kung Fu is an internal practice that permits men to retain certain bodily secretions, which are a source of in incomparable energy when stored and recirculated to higher vital centers. One prevents loss of this biochemical energy by not ejaculating. Stopping ejaculation is not to be confused with stopping orgasm. The sexual kung fu method provides an altogether unique and superior type of orgasm repeated over lengthy periods of lovemaking. Its secret is simply there is no loss of seminal fluid during orgasm. By practicing control of certain muscles, tendons, and fascia of the lower trunk, and by allowing the genital pressure to spread over the entire body, the seminal fluid is withheld. At the same time, one thrills to pleasures of infinite variety. Indeed, the joys of this kind of love must be considered quite different from ordinary physical pleasure. The intensity is so great that it often leads to a spiritual awakening. A man who masters this method will find his sexuality so enhanced that he will feel a revolution has occurred in his life. The pair of lovers becomes a dynamo, generating great quantities of electromagnetic energy. With this method, one can make love more often than before, with tremendous benefits to one's health. Sexual Kung Fu stimulates production of precious hormonal secretions instead of depleting them, as is, ordinary, as is ordinarily the case with ejaculation. Every vital function is invigorated because one no longer discharges life energy through the genitals. Real sexual fulfillment lies not in feeling the life going out of you, but in increasing awareness of the vital current that flows through the loins. The body is further replenished by a method of steaming the vital energy up from the sexual centers to the brain and higher organs, such as the heart and crown of the head. The life-enhancing energy process is completed by exchanging energy with one's lover during a relaxed meditation following the creation of the supercharged sexual energy. This powerful release and sharing of life's vital force is the fundamental bond in human love. To awaken this dynamic energy is also to experience the force behind man's biological and spiritual evolution, also known as the rising kundalini. Extraordinary Power of the Sexual Elixir Wise men of the Orient have, from time immemorial, sought means of preventing discharge of the seminal fluid. Without exception, they have realized the tremendous implications of the sexual act. When performed with love and discipline, it may awaken dormant powers in the mind and body. The nervous and and endocrine systems are particularly open to improvement. The act of love has long been recognized as healing, but the Taoist masters sought to go beyond this and find the principles of physical immortality within it. 
many schools arose proposing various ways of tapping the secret elixir of sexuality. Those who fully understand conventional ejaculatory sex know it grossly exploits every gland and organ. With ejaculation, the internal pressure of life is expelled from the body, leaving behind in some sex-obsessed man only enough life force to fold a newspaper, squeeze food through the bowels, and make for the psychiatrist's couch. The sages considered one drop of semen equal to equal in vital power to 100 drops of blood. The Hindu holy man refer repeatedly to Amrita, the elixir of life, a rejuvenation substance that may be produced during prolonged sexual activity without ejaculation. The production of this elixir which Westerners might call a higher hormonal secretion, requires a sexual technique that prevents ejaculation and thereby allows the body to enter higher and higher states of energy. Extraordinary powers, including healing and clairvoyant perception, may evolve when one retains the semen and drives its power back up into the body. Many gifted minds have held that if one could retain these fluids for one's entire life, the body would not decay after death. The saints, Christian, Buddhist, Muslim, or Taoist, all use the power of dwelling in the vital seed to perform miracles. Many esoteric sects have urged the eating of the seminal fluid to increase sexual ability and bodily fitness. This practice is at least as rational as buying vitamins. Scientific analysis has found it to contain a treasure house of vitamins, minerals, trace elements, hormones, proteins, ions, enzymes, and other vital nutritional substances. But there is an additional property in the sperm seed which present-day science cannot analyze and is far more important than any vitamin. This may be called the life force. Though it registers on no scientific instruments, it is far from imaginary science since it separates the living from the dead. Ginseng root is an example of another natural substance which shows no special properties on the chemical analysis yet its life restoring powers are now widely acknowledged love making is a powerful healing tonic because it involves sharing the human life force which is far more potent than any herb or medicine Chinese aristocrats and adepts seeking the deepest level of fulfillment have long had the capacity to return the energy of the seminal fluid to the brain and vital bodily centers. But ordinary people in our society have until now had no technique for recycling this great life power to the body. Most men have found the sexual lure irresistibly attractive and have happily lost their seed when succumbing to it, unaware of the consequences to their health or that there was even an alternative available to them. With frequent ejaculation of sperm, vitality ultimately plummets. The big spender loses stamina, his vision becomes begins to weaken, hair tumbles from his skull, he grows old before his time. At first, he will not feel drained, but after years of abuse, his capacities will begin to drop alarmingly. When the hormonal secretions of the sexual glands are, regu are regularly leached out, the body is sapped at its root. Within a period of time that will range from months to decades, depending on the endowment of the individual, 
creative and sexual abilities are halved, and the ability to withstand disease and the frailties of old age is diminished. To regain failing powers, the desperate big spender of vital seed sometimes tries to borrow well-being from hormone injections, uppers, downers, intoxicants, megavitamins, hallucinogens, and aphrodisiacs. These substances frantically stuffed into the body may appear to help temporarily. He may seek to regain his dwindling sexual powers with personal power purchased with money or political influence. If he is on a spiritual path or is surrounded by a loving community of family and friends, this feeling of a failing life power will be slowered. But so long as the prodigious energy waste continues, decline is inevitable. The organs of digestion will be unable to assimilate sufficient nutritional energies to replace those irrecoverable life energies lost by ejaculation. The Taoist method of cultivating sexual energy recirculates to the body the hormones, proteins, vitamins, enzymes, minerals, and electrical energies of the semen. When they are conserved and transformed, one enjoys a marvelous sexual life, improved health, deep inner balance, and rising spiritual consciousness. The Taoist method of love actually stimulates the production of hormonal substances of unusually high quality. One can learn to focus energy on the endocrine glands during the act of love. When the glands are bathed in energy, the quality of their secretions increases. More importantly, their quality improves. At higher stages in the practice, the hormones develop, develop extraordinary properties. The sexual kung fu method allows one to generate and conserve more nervous and hormonal energy than are necessary for ordinary functioning. This excess vitality may be channeled to strengthen the body and to raise mental and spiritual abilities. When lovers are in close embrace, subtle yin and yang energies are con concentrated into vortices from the sexual region to the head and eventually remain in the head at all times. Why has the spiritual power of sex been kept a secret? Our race has finally grown aware of the need to conserve natural resources, lest we consume ourselves to total ruin. Fresh water, soil, forests and fuels must be spared, food produced more efficiently, building and transportation accomplished with less waste. We have already exhausted the major portion of the readily recoverable riches of the planet. The cost of basic commodities skyrockets because, with the few resources left, we continue to overproduce inefficient machines such as cars and unproductive military armaments, tanks, missiles, etc. Everyone is eager to conserve natural resources, but few even dream of conserving the most critical resource of all, one's own vital energies. The careful harboring of the energy stored within men's seed is a truly rational energy program. Yet this aspect of conservation is entirely overlooked by politicians and health experts. One reason for this neglect is simply general ignorance of the ancient and highly secret methods used in the past. Taoist masters gained knowledge of these methods through unknown millennia of relentless searching for the secret principles animate matter. These methods are the fruit of many generations of inspired medica meditation by sages 
coupled with my close observations on modern life. The Taoist masters have bound to reveal their potent secrets to only the most select disciples. Those who had proven their devotion to the master's ideas by years of arduous self-sacrifice and service. Why did the masters feel so strongly compelled to hide their tremendous knowledge from the public? The reason for this secrecy is not easily comprehended by the Western public today. The mass media have fostered a state of mind in, in which anyone's life is everyone's business. The most intimate details of private sex life are the most greedily lapped up. Advertisers assure their clients today nothing sells unless it is sexy. This mentality ha has made sex in America into a disposable commodity, making it harder in our private lives to experience sex as an intimate pleasure that can be cultivated over time to ever-deepening levels. Today, sex is often consumed and thrown away as soon as the lover becomes old or an inconvenience. Even the women in the harem of Chinese emperors and aristocrats fared better, being assured of material comfort for life in exchange for their sexual favors. The court society favored the position of men, but at least the female sexual energy was respected for its healing benefits and honored as being necessary for the spiritual development of the male. A classic Taoist story tells of a woman who learned the process of sexual transformation and exchange her yin energy with her lover's yang energy and thereby achieved immortality. She thus became the guide to ancient emperors on the subject of love. There is a recorded historical instance of a palace maid in 690 AD becoming the empress on the death of the emperor. Empress Wu, respected for her mastery of the art of love, ruled wisely for several decades until her death. The ancient Taoist masters were not superstitious. They were natural scientists who laid the foundation for amazing technological advances in medicine, chemistry, biology, navigation, and many other fields that would not be discovered by Western scientists until 2000 years later nor did they crave exclusive possession of their potent knowledge. They had their reasons for secrecy, and their reasons were well-founded at the time. They were custodians of the doctrine taught to them by their masters, and feared the misuse of the great force unlocked by the secret principles. Perhaps they felt an obligation to protect the public from its tendency to distort the purest teaching to suit its own base instincts. In rural China, which was more, much less populous then, someone with such esoteric knowledge could easily become a chieftain or a king. A warrior could use his power to defeat his opponents. The Taoist masters thus th thought it dangerous to spread their teachings too widely and pass them on to only a few chosen disciples before departing their earthly life. To guarantee that the formula not be used for selfish purposes, these masters often transmitted to each disciple only a part of the doctrine. Thus, only if the disciples banded together and shared their learning could the supreme potences be unleashed. If anyone selfishly withheld his learning, they would never receive the whole doctrine. In the course of many generations, fragments of the innermost secrets came to be regarded as the whole. My attempt is to reunite many dis disparate parts into an organic whole, which I believe similar to the most ancient and complete teachings. Why reveal the secret now? 
Why violate the, violate the traditional Chinese teaching method and expose to the general public these powerful principles? The simple reason is that the historic moment is already late. The human condition is too desperate to deprive our species of a potentially great infusion of vital energy. If the human race is not quickly infused with a new life energy to render it more harmonious than it has been for most of the last 2000 years, we are all earthly masters and mortals threatened with an untentably harsh existence, if not extinction. There are so many wizards of the computer, stock market, test tube, and spectator sport, but so few of the art of life. Our race spends its brief span fiddling with statistics, black boxes, noxious chemicals, and above all, with meaningless words. A, major a majority of Americans daily pass more than six hours in a mesmerized trance Induced, induced by a colored shadow dancing in a box of glass. These machines have inadvertently become instruments of our own destruction. A TV programmed mind is not a free mind. Too few devote even one second to entering deeply the great current of life hidden within ourselves. Yet all the technological energy is eagerly sought is apish imitation of the electrifying ecstasies found hidden within the body and mind. There are positive signs. In Taoist thinking, any excess eventually leads to its opposite. It is clear that the reason for the chaotic state of planetary affairs is the revolutionary advance in human consciousness. In simplest terms, hydrogen bombs hover above us only because we are clever enough to conjure them up. Hatred contains the seeds of love. We have created a crisis in order to force a solution demanding that we restore our balance with one another and nature. Among the most important implications of this soaring up of consciousness is that the ordinary man will be admitted to secrets of life and mind that were formerly reserved for the chosen few. The French scientist Schwaller de Lubitz elucidated this idea. It is certain that such a revolution in thought is not the result of whim. It is in fact a question of cosmic influence to which the earth, along with everything in it, is subjected. A phase in the gestation of the planetary particle of our solar system is completed. A new period must begin, and this is heralded by seismic movement, climatic changes, and finally above all by the spirit that animates man. Not only do troubles press consciousness to evolve, but changing consciousness bursts the constraints of existing order. I hope that the Taoist practices of cultivating male energy presented here will attain higher perfection when subject to the shock of opposing ideas, scientific study and personal experiment, and the whole race's inventive genius. Today in China, it is formally prohibited to keep secret beneficial practices. One must reveal all knowledge that may improve the general welfare. Henceforth, closely guarded preparations of medical, medicinal herbs, roots, mineral waters, barks, muds, flowers, gems, venoms, as well as yogic and meditation practices will reach perfection more quickly by serving all. So the revelation of the Taoist secrets of sex is a contribution to human culture that may take time to manifest its real influence. Where a few great minds once acted, the full race of human genius must now struggle to save our world from the dangers of its own access. What is Qi energy? Essence, Qi, and Spirit 
are the three jewels of life from Book of Changes and the Unchanging Truth by Master Ni Hua Ching. Taoist cultivation of sexual energy cannot be understood until the Chinese concept of qi is clear. Qi, also known as prana, the warm current, kundalini power, or the electromagnetic life force, is very difficult to describe because this energy is invisible and cannot be seen. However, we can feel it. Qi is simply the Chinese word for breath. On the physical level, it is raw air that we breathe in and out, revitalizing us and keeping us alive. 